All right, everybody, with me being gone today, we're going to still keep on keeping on with talking about genetics. And so if you would, everyone take out your notebooks. We have a little bit of vocab to do, as well as I'm going to show you a few practice problems. And then after the video, we'll let you do it on your own. So we are now into chapter 11, which deals with meiosis and genetics. And if you remember back to seventh grade, you did some Punnett squares and learned about how to do these crosses, and that's what we're going to be doing this chapter as well, but a little bit more advanced in seventh grade. So let's start off with some of the language. Um, the first words I'd like you to write down are homozygous versus heterozygous. All right, now we've had the prefixes homo and hetero before. Homo means the same. Hetero means different. We also just had zygote before, which we know that that's the first cell of a new individual. So if something is homozygous, it means that they have the same case letters for each, and kind of a new word here is allele. So our examples would be big R, big R, or little r, little r. So it just means that they got either the dominant or recessive trait from both the mom and the dad. Hetero, as we well know, means different. And so what we're going to say here, very simply, is they have different case letters. Or alleles. And so our example would be big R, little r. Perhaps they got the big R from mom and the little r from dad or vice versa. So those are our first two words. Our next words dealing with genetics are words that I kind of already mentioned already, and that is dominant and recessive. Okay, now much like we've heard the word dominant before, it could be a team that's really, really good. It could be something that kind of, you know, overpowers another. And with dominant, as we talk about with genetics, some people say that the dominant traits are always the most popular. That's actually not the case. In fact, um, if that was the case, all of us would be dwarfs because dwarfism is actually a dominant trait where being normal height is actually recessive. So um, don't necessarily think of dominant as always being the most popular. But what we do want to say here is that dominant will overpower and show through a recessive. And they are indicated by a capital letter. So in this case, we'll just say big R. <coughs> Recessive means that these will be shadowed or hidden by dominant allele. And so we write them as a small letter R. Or recessive characteristic. So one in humans that we'll look at in just a little bit is having freckles is dominant to not having freckles. However, someone that is freckled, they could be big F, big F, or they could be big F, little f. As long as you have at least one capital letter, it means that you have that trait. Someone that does not have freckles, those of you that don't have freckles, you have to be little f, little f, because you have that recessive trait. All right, then let's get to our last two. We have what we call phenotype and genotype. All right, and how we'll use this is once we run crosses, we'll give what's called the phenotypic and genotypic ratio. Now, the way that I like to teach students how to do this is underline the pH on phenotype because the pH refers to the physical traits of the individual. So this is stuff that we can actually see. For example, again, if we talk about someone that has freckles, someone that has dimples, 
someone that has a cleft chin. We can see those things happening. The genotype, so it kind of has that word gene in there, these are the actual alleles. And another word for that again are the letters of the trait. So we can't see and you know say to someone, hey, you're freckled, so you're big F, big F. You might get swat in the head if you say that. You also can't say, you know, oh, you're big F, small F, or whatever it happens to be. Um, genotype is not something that we can physically see. It's the actual letters or alleles of that individual. So collectively, what we can do then is by now using this language is we can put together some of those Punnett squares that you learned about from seventh grade. And so I have just two examples that we're going to take a look at here, and then we'll, um, we'll let you do it on your own. So let's take a look at this first one, and it's on one that I already mentioned to you. So in humans, freckles are dominant, which we signal by big F, to non-freckles. That'd be a small f. It says to cross a homozygous person with a non-freckled person. Okay? Now the first step is to draw a Punnett square. Hopefully you remember what these look like from seventh grade. Look something like this. That's a Punnett square. And what we want to do is we want to look at, all right, what do the parents look like in terms of their letters? So the first person is homozygous with freckles and then cross it with a non-freckled. All right, this one I should have wrote in here, freckled. Okay, so we're going to pretend that they're homozygous freckled. So homo means same. They're freckled, which is dominant. So for this individual, we put big F, big F. Again, homo, same, freckled is dominant. We cross it with a non-freckled person. Now, this doesn't say homozygous or heterozygous, and this is not one of my errors. Um, but since we know that non-freckled is recessive, its letters have to be little f, little f. So that's how we would set up this cross. And setting up the cross is always the most important. The golden rule of crosses is rows go with rows, Columns go with columns, capital letters first. So do this one with me. You, can, you don't have to do it on your paper, but in your head. So this individual offspring would be big F, little f. This one, big F comes down, little f comes over. Big F down, little f over. Big F down, little f over. So not a lot of variety in this cross. All of them end up being the same. So what we'll ask on crosses is to give the genotypic and phenotypic ratio. So again, the physical trait is what do these look like? And so our answer, we always are going to have four offspring, so our number should always equal four, is going to be four to zero freckled. Again, how do we know that? We know that because there's at least one big F in each of these children. Genotypically, genes, we're going to use words like homozygous, heterozygous, and dominant recessive. We don't use the freckled words anymore. So genotypically, all of these are big F, little f. So again, we're going to have four to zero, and because they have one big F, one little f, we say they're four to zero heterozygous. And we don't need to say heterozygous dominant because heterozygous just means heterozygous. Don't need to change. All right. This is kind of an easier one. Now let's go to the more difficult one. All right. And this is, again, a mono hybrid cross, which means that we're dealing with just one trait. Mono in science means one. All right. So another one, and this is real life again. In humans, having dimples is dominant to not. Cross a heterozygous, freckled, that should say dimpled, person with another 
heterozygous dimpled person. Doing really good here. So again, we start off with our cross, our Punnett square. Looks something like this. We want to figure out, okay, what is parent one? Well, parent one is heterozygous. Hetero means different. Big D, little d. So they have dimples, but they're hetero. Crossed with another heterozygous dimpled person. So hetero, different, we'd have big D, little d. Now, does it matter which individual goes on each of these axes? No, it does not matter. Just individual one goes here, two, or two, and one. So, golden rule of crosses, rows go with rows, columns go with columns. So this one would be big D, big D. This one, big D, small d. This one, big D, little d. And this one has two small. Again, if we ask for the phenotypic and genotypic ratio of these crosses, phenotype, physically, what do they look like? We look at this one, has two big Ds, so it has dimples. These children have at least one big D, which means that they would be dimpled. This individual does not have one, so it would be non-freckled. So what we would say for our pheno, again, what do they look like? Three to one, and we'd say dimpled to not, or dimples to no dimples, however you would like to phrase that. Genotypically, again, looking at the genes, this is different than these two, and it's different than this. Again, our number is always going to equal to four because we have four possibilities, four boxes. And this is as fancy as we can get with a monohybrid cross. We always, again, go from most dominant to least. So what we would say is we have a one to two to one ratio. And this gets to be a lot of writing, but we do have to, to write it this way. We would say one homozygous dominant to two heterozygous. And again, we don't need to say dominant on that one. Just hetero is good enough. And then we would need to say homo recessive for that one. So this is how Punnett squares are done. This is as complicated as we get with a monohybrid cross. As we get going through the chapter, we're going to add some complexities and, and different things to this. Um, so now is your turn to uh, do a little practice. You'll be getting a, a little practice sheet here momentarily. Um, but again, if you need to go back on this video and check stuff out, feel free to do so. Uh, sorry about my mistakes. I haven't done this for a while. Um, but overall, again, we, these are the crosses that we're looking at um, and the vocab that we reviewed that's uh, coming up in this chapter. So thanks for listening, and now you should be getting your worksheet, and uh, we'll look at it starting tomorrow. Thanks, guys.